Hello everybody. Remember, the law of comparative advantage states that a country should specialise in the production of a good or service it can produce at the lowest opportunity cost. Then it should trade, and for trade to be mutually beneficial there needs to be a suitable exchange rate. The end result of all of that is that countries do specialise in where they have this comparative advantage. Prices are lower and they can maintain that advantage for a long period of time. Okay. Everyone kind of buys from this country that has the advantage. But in the real world, there are lots of uh, limitations to this theory, which explains why lots of different countries will produce the same kinds of goods and services, and why a country that you might think has got a comparative advantage may actually struggle to sell its goods and services abroad, despite what the theory actually says. So what are the limitations to the model, which um, maybe limit the theory and hold the theory back to explain exact real-world trade phenomena. Well, one, the model assumes there is perfect knowledge. It assumes that consumers will always know where the lowest prices are and will always buy where the lowest prices are. That's not always true in the real world. Consumers may not have that information. The model assumes no transport costs, so it assumes that, fine, a country may have a cost advantage compared to other countries, and therefore the price it can produce, or the efficiency it can produce that is better, and therefore the final price is lower than other nations. But if you add on the fact that there might be huge transport costs for other nations to buy those products, then that might distort the advantage, it might erode the advantage, and make this nation less competitive. So Australia might have the comparative advantage in lots of different goods and services, but for countries like America or the UK to buy from them, may not be actually worthwhile, it might, be, it might not be in their best interest when you add on the transport costs, which may distort the comparative advantage that a country like Australia may have for certain goods and services. The model assumes no economies of scale, but actually if a country does have comparative advantage and they're able to supply the world market, then they may benefit hugely from economies of scale that might lead them to actually exploit their advantage for much longer. Flip it. Maybe a country that doesn't have a comparative advantage is able to exploit economies of scale better than a nation that does have the advantage. And this could distort the comparative advantage gains. Because if there are economies of scale, then whoever benefits from them can actually benefit from lower average costs and maybe to lower prices. It's an artificial kind of advantage uh, that doesn't come from the use of factors of production. It doesn't come from the opportunity cost idea that the model uh, would explain. So not actually accounting for economies of scale, assuming constant returns of scale all the time, is quite unrealistic. What about rates of inflation? So again, a country's comparative advantage may be eroded if inflation rates, relative inflation rates, are quite high in that nation. We're assuming no import controls. What if there are tariffs or quotas put on a country's goods and services where it has a comparative advantage and selling those abroad becomes very difficult? That can erode the price and cost advantage that a country may have. What about non-price competitiveness? That's ignored in this model as well. So even though a country may not have the comparative advantage in producing something, it may have benefits for its products in other ways. Reliability, brand loyalty, service quality, overall quality, innovation in that product, technology in that product. These non-price factors may dominate. And actually, even though the price might be higher compared to another country because this nation doesn't have a comparative advantage. It doesn't matter. It may still be able to sell in large quantities abroad. What about exchange rate movements? They've been ignored in this model completely as well. <laughs> so if a country's got a comparative advantage but also a very, very, very strong exchange rate, that can erode the kind of competitiveness gains. And finally, what about R&D? R&D investment is ignored. And this is why in the real world you have lots of different countries producing similar goods and services, because each country may well uh, delve into different levels of research and development related spending, which means that the final kind of product produced might be slightly different. And that can explain why lots of different countries will produce cameras, let's say, or computers, let's say, because of different levels of research and development spending. What it can also lead to is that countries that maybe don't have a comparative advantage in producing something, if they plow a lot of money into research and development and are able to innovate and produce brand new products, they can patent those products and therefore gain a monopoly in that market. So even though they don't have the advantage, because they've spent huge amounts of money on research and development, innovation, they can actually still uh, monopolize the market and dominate the market in that sense.
So these are all big limitations of the model, which um, kind of hinder the model in explaining uh, global world trade patterns as we see at the moment. So hopefully you understand those and understand how they do distort the, the theory right there and how they go against the theory. Thanks for watching, guys. See you all next time.